Okay, just testing the sound. Is it fine? <clears throat> yeah. So apologies here. I I um I got told I had this talk ten minutes ago, so <laughs> it's a bit of a rush. Um, <clears throat> I was scheduled toward the end of the day originally. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the Risk Five microprocessor. So how many of you um, actually have used it or are any familiar with um, assembly coding? Okay, so quite a lot. And how many, how many have um, used any Risk Five before? Okay, so <laughs> that's good. Um, <clears throat> so my name is uh, Eric Engheim. I work for a company called Sixty North. Uh, we do consulting work, and actually, what I normally do is create educational content for a programming language called Julia, um, which is a new language for machine learning, um, data science, high-performance computing. So that's a bit different from what I'm going to be talking about here, which is more about sort of a hobby interest of mine for, for a long time. I started programming assembly codes on the 68K, uh, Motorola 68000, back in um, the, late 18, <laughs> the late 1980s um, on Amiga 1000. Um, <clears throat> not quite that. Long ago. So I tried a, the different architectures, and I think Risk Five is a kind of it's a quite exciting new architecture to work on. So, um, <clears throat> what exactly is Risk Five? So one thing that is important to keep in mind when uh, can, when thinking about Risk Five is that it's Unlike x86 and um, um, ARM, it's not an architecture that was primarily made for industry. So those other architectures um, are typically used by and made for industry. Um, RISC-V, in contrast, comes out of university from Berkeley, and it's actually the fifth generation of the very first RISC processor, RISC-1, that was created by a group um, I'm not sure if it was led by, but David Patterson is a pretty important name in this history. He was the one that coined the term risk reduced instruction set um, computer. So this was back in 1981, and this has been going through several generations um, <clears throat> until they got to risk five. Um, and in, with risk five, they wanted to create something that was usable. Um, both for academic purposes and also for industry. So it should be something that you can implement that gives you high performance in a realistic setting. But it can al also meet goals like, for students, you don't want a too complex architecture that is hard to learn. You want something where uh, students can realistically implement a simple risk processor in the first semester. So for me as a hobbyist, this is kind of an interesting thing with Risk Five. It's something that if you're interested in um, <clears throat> playing around with microprocessors as, on a sort of hobby basis, this is a very interesting architecture to develop. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you often see RISC-V pitched as a sort of Linux for um, microprocessors. And I think that this is actually a little bit of bad kind of characterization. For me, that was actually what made me not care that much about looking at uh, Risk Five uh, initially, um, because it sounded like it was just a kind of a Me Too microprocessor, where <clears throat> um, it was just open source but just did everything else like um, like everybody else. I think a more important part of Risk Five is actually that it's a modular design, which is not common in the industry. Um, so Risk Five is composable extensions unlike what you find with x86 and ARM. So I'm going to use a bit of a silly analogy, Tara, to try to um, explain what we mean by that. We can imagine something like x86, it started back in 1978 with sort of one menu. Here you've got 80 instructions. And then customers want more. So they're adding more to this buffet of instructions. And they keep adding and adding and adding. And so. <clears throat> Eventually, they have 1,300 instructions. 
um, <clears throat> so they've been adding three instructions roughly every month since 1978. And actually, this is a low number because this is for 32-bit. For 64-bit, it's around 1,500 instructions now. <clears throat> and it isn't actually all that much better for ARM microprocessors. 32-bit uh, is about 500 instructions, depending a bit on how you count it. Uh, for 64-bit, it's about 1,000. Now you can contrast that with RISC-V, which is just 47 instructions that you have to implement. Just reading the specification would take you about uh, six hours. <clears throat> so what is the difference? Why so few instructions? Not because RISC-V is more like a menu. You get to choose, I just want to buy the fries and the apple cake, and you only pay for that. And what do I mean by pay? Well, I mean in terms of transistors. You're only paying for the features that you're using, and you don't have to pay for all the other stuff that is accumulated over time. <laughs> so these two sheets, well, let me see if I have this sheet here. So this is kind of most of what you need to know about RISC-V, the instructions here. Um, you, sh you need a quite a thick book to do that with x86. Um, so the first part here, this are the standard instructions that you have to implement. And most of the other stuff here, that is, those are just um, <clears throat> common extensions <clears throat> that you don't have to. <clears throat> and why does all this matter? Well, it's because complexity costs money. So each of these little squares right, is a chip. And you would think that if I make a, a, a chip that's twice as large, well, the cost will increase with twice. I'm having twice as many transistors. But no, it actually grows with the square of the area. It's a quadratic equation. And the reason for that is that you get these random um, faults at random points on the chip. So if you have a, very, um, <clears throat> a larger area, it's a, a bigger chance that there's going to be a flaw in that area. And that's kind of why it's quite expensive to have large chips compared to small ones. Um, <clears throat> so if you compare uh, the RISC-V rocket, it's one of the simpler RISC-V designs with an ARM Cortex-A5. And uh, they have kind of similar capabilities, similar amount of, of cache memory. Uh, you will find that the die size, size of the chips, is about half on the RISC-V. But this translates into a price that's one-fourth of the ARM Cortex-A5. So that's a big difference. Um, now, you shouldn't exaggerate this implication because when you get the desktop-style chips, like, say, the M1 um, that Apple has released at 16 billion transistors, and a lot of what's on there has nothing to do with decoding um, <clears throat> instructions. There's a lot of other types of features. So for desktop class chip, um, the chips that you, the um, transistors you need for decoding instructions uh, is going to be dwarfed by other things. But when you're working in the embedded space, this matters a lot. So we can imagine that uh, for embedded type of hardware, maybe low end um, phones, you're going to start seeing risk five. Um, entering the market because they're going to have such a cost advantage. Um, <clears throat> and also for specialized hardware, where you typically want to make, for instance, small cores. It's hard to make small cores if you have a lot of instructions. <clears throat> uh, but of course, this is for the same volume. Right now, um, you will typically find that the risk five chips that you might, or boards you might want to buy, those are probably going to be more expensive than ARM, simply because they're not produced in the same volume. But when volumes are equal, you're going to see the cost advantage. <clears throat> so what are these RISC-V extensions? Well, they're given names from A to Z. And then <clears throat> that makes you it easier to kind of specify the compilers and so on, what architecture you're working on. So this first part here. RV32, that's RISC-5, 32 bits, could be 64 or even 128, actually. And then this says that we have the MAFD extension. So M is multiply and divide. This is for atomic um, <coughs> instructions and so on. 
because this is kind of a, a standard set of instructions that you might want to use for a general purpose operating system, such as Linux, uh, these are abbreviated to a G. So when you see a G, it means sort of the standard instructions you might want to have on a sort of desktop class um, machine. <clears throat> the way you deal with this at runtime is that all the RISC-V processors have to implement this command status register and where you have a bunch of special um, <clears throat> functions that you can read. So on the sheet, you have this uh, section here that explains the instructions that you can use to read and check what extensions does the chip I'm currently running on actually support. <clears throat> you don't have to necessarily do this. It is practical, say, uh, you are doing a lots of matrix multiplications. Maybe you're doing something machine learning task. And then you can check, do I have the uh, vector extension, for instance? If I have that, I can take a different code path and I can compute <laughs> those um, matrix multiplications a lot faster. But you don't necessarily need to set that up because all the instructions that are not supported get trapped. So that is sort of like an interrupt. You will jump to somewhere else in the code in the operating system, and you can simulate those instructions that are not supported. That means that <clears throat> given you have operating system set up for this, you can your program can in principle run on any RISC five microprocessor regardless of the extensions that it supports. Uh, final thing to, to note about extensions is that they're frozen. That means that once it's been ratified which instructions are going to be in an extension, um, and how they're going to work, this is never going to change. Um, <clears throat> so you can't, um, so this is good for backwards compatibility, right? If you've written code to work with one particular set of extensions, um, that's going to continue working for a long time. This is also an important goal for RISC-V. Um, when universities use other um, instruction sets in the past, they found that it was hard for long-term use because they often have particular instructions that really only made sense in that area, you know, for particular optimization. Risk is particularly risk five is particularly made to have a very long-term view that this architecture should exist for a very long time. Let's contrast this with x86 and x86 and ARM. What if they decided, say ARM, that we want to be comp uh, competitive? with RISC-V in the sort of low-end um, embedded space. So we're going to cut up our, our huge instruction set, about 1,000 instructions, into lots of different extensions, like RISC-V. Could they do that? Well, not really, because you have all this legacy software, which is not written to take that into consideration. So if they reduce a new chip with just a few extensions, the existing software wouldn't run, right? Because it doesn't know to check any kind of status register. So it will just crash. <clears throat> and you don't have an operating system. Existing operating systems are not set up to, to trap and simulate uh, other instructions. So unlike RISC, you don't have the RISC V, you don't have the, um, <clears throat> the ecosystem, the tools, and the practices, and so on to support this. On RISC V, there's a suit of, of tools to verify that you're following the specification that you're checking extensions and so on. Now you could do it to the existing instruction set architectures, um, but it's not very much value to say, okay, we're gonna have an extension for these 20 new instructions and you already have uh, 1500 instructions that you have to implement. <laughs> so just to clarify some of the, the terminology that I used here, um, we got to separate between instruction set architecture and the micro architecture. Risk five is primarily a instruction set architecture. That's what it defines. That's an it's an open instruction set architecture, and that's sort of like the interface to your microchip. Whereas the microchip, uh, the micro architecture is how it actually works internally. So as an example. Um, an AMD and an Intel chip, right? They can both run the same code, even though they have completely different microarchitectures. And that's because they have the same instruction set architecture. So the ISA 
that is what you see as an assembly programmer or as a compiler writer. <clears throat> so where is risk five used? So you can see there is um, already a bunch of different kinds of styles of boards um, that exist that use risk five processors. Um, people talk about that with all these extensions that you can optionally add and, and uh, companies can add their own um, custom extensions, will we just not end up with this kind of jungle where with incompatibilities and, and, and a mess? Um, <clears throat> it's important to understand that <clears throat> that makes <clears throat> that makes some sense for <clears throat> if you're making something like more like a personal computer, but those boards are probably going to standardize on the G extensions. But for a lot of other things, it's specialized hardware, um, such as accelerators, and you're not going to be running all sorts of software on those. So compatibility is not as important there. So <clears throat> you might still in the future have x86 and um, ARM, sort of where that's the, the main system, but you might have all sorts of uh, extra hardware accelerators that are actually risk five processors. <clears throat> Another thing where you're starting to see risk five appear is for the internet of things. So this is uh, one example, Cepedmex Duino. It has neural network processor, machine vision, you can connect cameras and so on. <clears throat> I think this one is, quite interesting. This is uh, from Esperanto Technologies. So they have this system on a chip, this one here, 28 billion transistors. <clears throat> and it has uh, four Maxian general purpose uh, processor, RISC-V, 64-bit. Um, and on these, you can run basically like a Linux operating system, um, general purpose operating system. And there you can prepare, for instance, machine learning tasks, um, maybe heavy matrix multiplications. And the Maxians can dish that out to their minions. So that's a 1,088 uh, cores that each have implemented a, a vector processing instruction set. So those are very, very small um, cores. Uh, so they are quite simple, but they do one, one particular thing very fast, like vector processing. And that's why this manages to have really high performance, 100 to 200 um, ter operations at less than 20 watts. So just these minions, the 1,088, I think they are less than 10 watts. Um, so comparison, the M1 that Apple released, that was about 15 watts, I think. So to understand a little bit more of the kind of technical details uh, when I'm going through, I'm going to go a bit through RISC-V assembly code. Um, if you want to get into this, this Cornell RISC-V simulator is a kind of easy one to get into. It doesn't support all that many instructions. You can see them down here. Um, you got all the registers here, the code that we're pasting in, and here you can see the code to execute. <coughs> If you're interested in trying this, you can use this link, take a photo of that or something. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to go through to try to explain is this simple counter program. It takes a value in the this X1 register that you will have to set yourself, and then it starts counting down. Um, the instructions for um, assembly code tends to use these kind of abbreviated words like Add, add, add i, which is add immediate, sw store word, and so on. But we're going to go through uh, these in more detail. <clears throat> you also have in risk five a number of pseudo instructions. Um, one of the reasons for that is that because the instruction set is so compressed and small, they try to be clever about it. So in, uh, each instruction can be kind of used in different ways. That can hurt readability a bit. So you have pseudo instructions, which are just really just translates into actual ESA instructions that kind of convey better what they're for. So this is load immediate, which is actually what you intend with the 
the ad that you saw earlier. So <clears throat> central comp, uh, <clears throat> central thing for um, microprocessors to understand is registers. And registers is, I think this is kind of interesting from a historical perspective. It's a very old idea. This is an old mechanical calculator, a so-called arithmometer, um, actually a Russian one. And this has three registers here. Um, it works by you're pulling down these different dials here to select digits to get a number, and then you crank here, and it adds to the accumulator down here. <laughs> and you can actually move this whole thing um, left and right, a number of digits, and when you're adding, it puts the numbers down on um, shifted over. So this essentially lets you multiply by 10, 100, 1,000, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so this one doesn't directly support multiplication, but you can you can kind of achieve it by um, doing these shift operations and additions. And you can I think you can subtract by just cranking the other way. And what's interesting is that this is exactly what the arithmetic logic unit in a microprocessor does. It only does those same operations as this old mechanical device. It can add, subtract, and shift to the left and right. Of course, this uses binary number systems, so it's it's going to shift in 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on, rather than 10, 100, and so on. Um, and of course, for registers, we have a lot more registers than on a mechanical device. On RISC-V, we have 32 registers. <clears throat> One of them is <clears throat> a bit special because it's always zero. It means whatever I write into it, I'm always going to read um, zero out. Now this sounds maybe a bit nonsensical, but it's actually, if you start <clears throat> playing around with RISC-V assembly, you will find that this is actually very practical, that you have a register that you always know is zero. <clears throat> I wish that was actually in a lot of other architectures. Um, <clears throat> when you're programming <clears throat> RISC-V, uh, you typically don't use those X names for the registers. You tend to use these aliases for the same registers. And that's because when you're, <clears throat> when you're programming, for instance, I make uh, implement a function that's going to be called from a high-level um, programming language, and I want to be able to pass arguments. How do I do that? Well, you follow typically conventions. There's a binary um, API. Um, and this says that these registers from A0 to <clears throat> So A7, that's where you pass <clears throat> your arguments. And the return value is, is in this A0 that you can see here. Now, when you um, call a function, you're responsible for um, restoring or making sure you don't overwrite registers that the calling program might be using to do different calculations. This can be cumbersome to have to do that uh, for just simple calculations. So there's a convention where these T0 <clears throat> to T5 are used for, uh, um, you don't have to preserve those. I'm just going to take some water to clear my throat here. <clears throat> um, yeah, and then you have other registers like RA, which turns a return address. So when I call a function before it gets called, I store where I'm currently at in the RA register so I can easily get back. And then you have SP, which is a stack pointer. <laughs> so this is how a typical um, assembly instruction looks. And if you're used to high-level languages, this is a bit different. Uh, we don't call these arguments. We call those operands in assembly code. Um, this is the destination register. This is where the results get put, as you can see in the kind of comments here. Um, in assembly code, of course, the operation you do is actually a number. It's an opcode. But instead of remembering a number each time, we're using a mnemonic um, that makes it easier to remember those. <clears throat> And you don't, you can't typically have sort of 
free number of arguments the way you have in high-level language. And the reason for that is that these instructions have to be encoded into binary form, into 32-bit um, word. So the instruction you're um, performing, the mnemonic is turned into an opcode, which is stored in these seven bits here. Um, and then the arguments, say the RG register requires five registers. So you can see here, if I just had arbitrary number of arguments, I would run out of space. Um, and this is also tells you why typically all, most of the RISC-V instructions, they take three arguments so that you can have a standard encoding format. And there's five bits for each of these operands. So if you know binary, that explains you why um, you can have 32 registers. So it's not actually a problem to, in principle, have enough transistors to have more registers. Uh, what limits the number of registers that you can have in a CPU is actually this. You know, how many bits do I have available to encode them? So there are other alternatives, but um, encodings, but I'm not going to cover that here. So what happens when you actually run an instruction in a microprocessor? So I'm going to show you <clears throat> how it basically works in a RISC processor. And this illustration that I made here is, a, of course, a major simplification of how a microprocessor works. A bunch of stuff has been thrown out. <clears throat> but just to be able to um, illustrate the things that I'm going to talk about here. So there's four clock cycles required to, to perform an instruction because it it's happens in four separate steps. For something like a CISC processor like x86, the way it traditionally worked, this would be a lot more complex. But RISC has tried to standardize into four uh, clearly defined steps in how an instruction is performed. And that has to do with um, a concept that was kind of pioneered with risk processor, which is pipelining. But I'm not going to have time to cover that here. <clears throat> so the first step is fetch. And what happens then is uh, it's the decoder that's the boss, it's in charge, and it's using these control lines to toggle on other computational units. So it's it's here, it's toggling on the program counter that says, okay, you can release your um, your current position in memory where the, the first instruction is. And that is sent out here <coughs> to the memory to pick a memory cell. And from the memory cell, you send the actual instruction into the instruction register. <coughs> Next uh, step is decode. And here, um, the instruction goes into the decoder. And based on what it finds in the instruction, it's going to toggle on different control lines. It says what, what pieces inside the CPU is going to be enabled. So this is going to say, what are the two registers I'm going to pick as input to the ALU? Um, and what operations I'm going to enable? I'm going to do an add or a shift, and so on. <clears throat> so the, it's uh, only a third step where you're actually executing and doing the, the thing you want. So say we're doing an addition. At this point, we're selecting the where the data from the two registers that we have selected it goes into the ALU, um, and the result comes out and gets stored in the uh, result register. <clears throat> and the last step is the write back step. This is where the decoder is selecting which outputs. This is what we call a multiplexer. So you can kind of choose, you know, which outputs am I sending um, data to? <laughs> it's similar here. You can choose what, what input am I taking this or this one. So here I'm selecting that is going to go back to a register that I selected here. So say the third register. <clears throat> so that will help maybe uh, understand a bit more how this program works. Given some comments here, I can kind of see what operations it's doing. So the add I. Um, you can see that it's, um, it adds a 1 to x0, but x0 is always 0. So that the result is that you're loading a 1 into x2. <clears throat> so this is used here in the subtract to allow you to kind of loop through. And on each, each loop through, you're subtracting one, uh, 1 from x1. So you're always going, x1 is going down. 
And when you're done with that, you're storing the results into this memory address. So that is X0, which is also always zero. So it's the fourth memory address where we're storing the result. <laughs> and then BLT is a branch um, if less than, so if X0 is less than X1, then you're going to the beginning. And the last one is halt, stop the execution. <clears throat> So you wouldn't necessarily have to write it like this. Um, the reason I did that was because there's no subtract immediate. So immediate is when you have encoded um, some of the data inside the instruction itself, such as one. And the reason there is no subtract immediate is that you could do this with add immediate instead, right? Because I can just put a minus one there. So there's actually no need. So this is kind of how they try to think about keeping the number of instructions minimal. Um, you could also have written it with the pseudo instructions to make it more clear what your um, intentions are. Um, a little bit, so I <clears throat> just want to explain that when we went through this the first time, I used the example of um, these non immediate ones where you're using two registers as input. If you're using add i, then one of the arguments is not a register, it's an actual number which is encoded in, with the instruction. And then uh, we're turning the multiplex around to say that we want to get to this, this one number in from the decoder, actually. And that's what's coming into the ALU. And the x0 comes from here. But of course, this is always 0. <clears throat> and then we get a result here. Store word is a little bit different. Also, if we look at the, the write back step, so you have to imagine that now there's been a sort of immediate calculation. We got a result into our multiplexer here, or result register. Uh, but rather than sending it back into a register, we're toggling the multiplexer and saying we want to use that on the address bus. So this 4 plus x0 is used to pick a memory cell here where we're storing the x. The x1 register gets stored into that memory location. <clears throat> so with this background, we can talk a bit about micro operations, which is kind of useful background information to kind of cover the thing that I think is most important with RISC-V, which is uh, how it deals with compressed instructions and macro operations. <clears throat> so a micro operation, then you can imagine the architecture is changed a little bit. Um, it's do one thing, typically in one clock cycle, uh, and typically, uh, one instruction turns into multiple micro operations, or just one. On RISC architecture, it will turn typically to one um, micro operations. On uh, CISC hardware, like an x86, uh, this can turn into many micro operations. And an interesting thing, despite the fact that they're called micro, they're actually not, the instructions are not small. They're actually quite uh, large in terms of bits. It can be 100 bits or something, one micro operation. So you can think of micro operations as sort of the interface, no, sorry, the, the uh, part of the implementation. They're specific to the uh, micro architecture. So even though you have the same um, instructions supported for different chips, um, you can have different micro operations. And you have um, ARM chips, for instance, with the same instruction set architecture that uh, don't use micro operations at all. And then you have high-end ARM chips with the same ISA, but which actually has micro operations internally. <laughs> so what they actually do is, normally you have these, these control lines, right? You're, you're toggling on these. Normally, uh, when you're decoding an instruction, you are <clears throat> um, you know, figuring out which <clears throat> of these bits to, to flip to, to do toggle on. And with micro operations, you use a decoder to kind of can all these uh, control lines that you're toggling on. So, you know, you have a one when you toggle it, zero when you're not toggling. And that's why it adds up to being all these number of bits, you know, that you can end up with a hundred bits because there's so many different parts you're going to toggle on and off inside the uh, processor, depending on how complex the micro architecture is. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Now, it doesn't make very much sense with the architecture I just showed you, at least for, for RISC, to have micro operations. It does make sense for a CISC processor because it allows you to make a CISC act a bit like a RISC processor internally for things like pipelining. But for this to make sense for a RISC processor, you have to have a superscalar microprocessor. And that means that you have multiple decoders that are running at the same time that are decoding um, <clears throat> several operations in parallel. And this gets put in the uh, microoperations buffer. And you're doing some kind of analysis where you're checking instructions that come after each other. Um, are the results related to each other? <laughs> if they're not, so you have a multiply and an addition, then I can run the multiply instruction in parallel with the addition. <clears throat> and so I can get more than one instruction carried out each clock cycle. <laughs> Now, how is this different from having multiple cores? Well, if you have multiple cores, you as a programmer have to see, OK, you have to handle multiple threads right, to get the extra performance. With the superscalar microprocessor, you don't see multiple threads. You just see one thread that's just running faster. And this is made even faster if you have what's called an out-of-order superscalar microprocessor, where <laughs> you can rearrange the instructions so that you can run them more easily in the parallel. Um, <clears throat> the problem that this requires a lot of extra silicon because you have to um, arrange the instruction results back afterwards to make sure it's not in the wrong order. So here is the um, <clears throat> the key thing that I think is interesting with Risk Five. Um, Compressed instructions and what we call macro fusion is something that has been developed over time and has been added to x86 processors over time. The benefit when designing RISC-V is that they knew about these things already and can take that into account when designing the microprocessor. <clears throat> so if we, if we <clears throat> take a step back and consider uh, CISC, processors like x86, a complex instruction set computers that have variable length instructions. Um, they started using micro operations <clears throat> um, as a way to deal with the fact that <clears throat> they were getting outcompeted in the 90s by risk processors. And by using micro ops, they can kind of simulate a risk processor internally because they, they cut up their complex instructions into all these simple risk-like instructions uh, that, take, uh, that can then easily be put into a pipeline, which is really only possible if you're dealing with instructions that have kind of the same number of clock cycles. <clears throat> well, there are exceptions to, to, to everything, but in general, you, most of your instructions should be similar number of clock cycles for this to work well. <clears throat> so you can see you get, well, some variable number of instructions coming out, and then you get some number of micro operations coming out. So does, this meant that for a while, CISC actually got the upper hand on risk processor uh, using micro ops, because variable length instructions enable them to have programs that took less space in memory. <clears throat> so this means that your cache, you can utilize cache more efficiently, gives you better performance. So what's the risk counter move to this? Well, that is compressed instructions. So that means that <clears throat> you have two instructions compressed into a 32-bit word. <laughs> so if you know the ARM architecture, there is two compressed instruction sets, uh, thumb and thumb two. Um, this had to be bolted onto ARM after the fact. So ARM actually has to do a mode switch and have to have separate decoders. It treats compressed instructions as a sort of separate instruction set architecture. Um, with RISC-V, you have the benefits that this could be designed in from the start. So the um, the format and the instructions and so on has taken that into consideration that they should support compressed instructions. It's just an extension. 
if you have the, that extension, you can support it. And it's actually very cheap to implement. It's only 400 logical gates, like AND or NAND and so on gates, that you need to implement compressed instructions. And it's not like a SIP operation. This is <clears throat> the decompression is very fast. But of course, it's not, it's not magic. Uh, you can't take every possible instruction you have and compress them. So instead, of how it works is you take the most commonly used instructions that most affect your performance, and you have compressed versions of them. But only if you have two operands. Why can't you have, why can't you have three operands when uh, you have a 16-bit instruction? Can you think about that? So with three operands, because there's five bits per operand, you would consume 15 bits just to specify the operands. Um, and you only have 16 bits, so that would leave you one bit to say what operation you're doing. So that's not going to be enough. <laughs> Here's something that seems a bit counterintuitive. Uh, and that is macro operation fusion. <clears throat> this is sort of the opposite of what MicroOps is about. You're taking in uh, fairly simple instructions and you're getting more complex ones out. So it's kind of like taking risk instructions in and you're getting CISC instructions out. How does that make any sense? Why do you want to do that? Well, it's actually Intel that discovered this, that um, <laughs> some of the instructions are just so simple that they're just kind of wasting resources. You can actually they could see that there's actually a possibility to encode more um, functionality within one micro operation. So the idea with micro op fusion is that <coughs> you take instructions that are just too simple and turn them into instructions that are more complex, but not so complex that they are like a sys construction. <clears throat> so the benefit of that is, uh, of course, what the size performance is, you know, how many micro operations that you do. So by having fewer micro operations, uh, you can get better performance. So yeah, to clarify, these macro operations, they do get turned into micro operations later, just to show you here. So this is why I think is sort of the risk five genius. So instead of having all these complex instructions supported, you can just put together two simple instructions in any kind of combination. And those two simple instructions are kind of like um, a complex instruction. So you have two compressed, uh, so four instructions here that are just compressed. So it looks like there's three instructions coming in. They get decompressed <laughs> into five instructions, and then you do macro up fusion, and you get three macro operations. And these micro op uh, these macro operations can then be decoded and turned into micro operations. So the end effect here is, for you're just uh, in terms of memory usage in the cache, you're only paying as if it was three instructions. And in terms of execution, you're only paying as if it was three instructions to execute, even if it's five that went in. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> to give a concrete example of how this works, um, <clears throat> here's a, um, some C code, very simple thing. Um, get index, you're getting an element uh, at index i in an array. And this is used often as an example of why you should have complex addressing modes, <clears throat> which is kind of used as a criticism typically against RISC-V because they don't have that. So if you want to perform this with Intel um, x86, the code would look something like this. I'm not going to cover that one. I'll, I'll talk more about the ARM one instead. So an ARM, ARM is not sort of as risk as something like RISC-V. ARM has instructions that look a bit risk-like. And the one example is kind of addressing modes. So this is LDR's load register. And it takes all this to compute and address in memory to load. You can see an explanation of it here. So LSL is logical shift left. So you're shifting two bits to the left, so you're the same as multiply by four. And why is that? Well, it's because um, R1, that is the second argument, this one. R0, that is the uh, first argument. So 
Because this is an integer, integers are in four byte boundaries. So that's why you're multiplying with a four. So you're, you're taking the, the offset for the index and you're adding that to the base address of the array. And then you get, and then you're looking that up in memory and storing R zero. R zero is where you return values for a function. And then finally BX is branch and link. And then the LR is a link register, the register that stores the return address. Now we can compare this with risk five. This doesn't look so good for risk five. It's twice as many instructions because you only have these very simple instructions. Uh, so it's going to take twice the memory. It's going to uh, twice the sort of the time to execute <clears throat> in theory. So the first thing we got to do here is shift uh, left logical immediate. That's this operation shifts the A1 register. So the A1, if you remember, that's the second argument of function a zero is the first argument so that this is the uh, the i we're multiplying that by four <coughs> then we're adding that to um the the array pointer address then when we have this new address we're using that with a load operation load word where we're using that as input and then finally we're returning <coughs> red is actually a pseudo instruction so it's actually short for this jump and link register. It actually does two operations. The first is a no operation because it goes to x0. So you only care about the second part, which is to take the the RA register plus the offset there, <coughs> zero, and put that into the program counter. And that has the effect of jumping in your program. But here is where the solution for risk five, <laughs> because <clears throat> let's see, uh, what you'll notice here is that they use two of the arguments are the same, or two, two of the operands are the same. That gives an opportunity to compress these instructions, and that's what you can do. Now, you wouldn't have to put this. This C dot is typically just uh, written as to indicate this is a compressed instruction. When you're actually writing assembly, you don't have to do this. The assembler will be able to figure that out for you. But that means that you can compress all of these instructions uh, because you really only need two operands. <coughs> so you can think about it, the operations that are happening as you can see described here in the comments. Um, <coughs> so this means that it's uh, the, the amount of memory it's gonna take is gonna be exactly the same as for ARM and Intel. But it's still four instructions to execute. So how do we deal with that? Well, we can do macro fusion. So with macro fusion, you have the rule for this to work, the destination register of two consecutive instructions. <laughs> These two, they have to be the same. And so <clears throat> that is possible with add and load word. So we can fuse those together. Now add LW, that is just a made up name. It does, there's no instruction called that. It's just to represent a, a fused uh, a macro operation. So you can see now that that operation does all of these things. And at this point, we, we now have only three micro operations inside the architecture that we actually have to um, execute. Uh, so that's only one more than on x86 and ARM. But can we do better? Um, we can from a um, from the point of view of micro operations. So we, if we rearrange this and we're using um, the T0 register, it's not the T0 is important, but I just rearranged it a bit so that we have three instructions that are using the same destination address. Um, and that allows us to do a macro of fusion of three, of three instructions. The downside of, of doing this approach is that you can see that we only have those three instructions which we can use to compress for and because now we're having a different operand for all three. So this gives us, again, I'm just made up a name, um, um, SLLI add LW as a, the macro, the fused, macro operation. But it's interesting if you compare that to ARM, 
is essentially doing exactly the same as his ARM LDR at this point. <laughs> is it doing the um, multiplying to get the the index base offset? It's adding the um, the base address and doing the memory lookup all in one instruction. So with this, we have the same number of micro ops, but of course we require 10 bytes rather than eight. <clears throat> uh, so that is very close. Uh, but of course, this is just one example. What if you're looking at a more, more realistic programs where this is hap where there's a lot of different instructions like this, <laughs> what is the end result? Can actually RISC V match ARM and x86 in terms of uh, uh, density of instructions and the number of instructions that have to be executed? <laughs> and there are some guys that actually investigated this. So there's a paper, um, the title is written down here. It's a bit long, the renewed case for reduced instruction set computer avoiding I say bloat with macro fusion for risk five. <clears throat> so what this has done is it's normalized on the number of instructions <clears throat> for um, x86-64 that has to be uh, computed for all these different programs that you see underneath here. And then they compare it with the number of instructions for other architectures and with the number of macro ops um, for when using compressed instructions of macro fusion for risk five and the number of micro ops in x86 x uh, 86 <clears throat> so the reason you can find the micro operations is actually that um x86 processors have these micro op counters internally so you can actually uh count that uh, so this is not a totally great comparison because um, the ARM numbers, right, are not the actual micro operations. Uh, but you can already see here that if you compare the uh, the purple and the yellow, that um, that are most comparable, that Risk Five is actually looking pretty good here. And what about the size of the programs? You can see here, with compressed instructions, Risk is in most cases, actually beating the other architectures, it's spending less memory, despite having so much simpler instruction sets than the others. Despite the others having a lot more complex instructions that can do more, they still end up using more space. And <clears throat> to be able to com make a more accurate comparison, um, what the people that wrote this uh, paper here did was they um, they looked, they analyzed, they used tools to run over the um, um, ARM code, and they made some heuristics or guesses about the number of micro operations that each instruction would uh, turn into. And that's because there are kind of rules of what you minimum will have to do. If you're doing an operation that causes writes to multiple registers, it's going to have to be um, a micro operation for every register write. So by using that as a kind of heuristic, um, they compare it and that you can see here in the graphs that are highlighted <laughs> that risk actually narrowly has fewer uh, micro operations that it has to perform than the competitors. A little bit caveat here is that um, I'm not sure whether they have taken into account the fact that you can do macro fusion um, on x86 and possibly an ARM, I'm not quite sure. Um, but this looks very promising for risk five. So, um, so in total, um, <coughs> what I think is great about this is that you can see, you can have these sort of, you can have a cake and eat it too. You can have a simple instruction set that you can easily learn but you're not actually sacrificing performance to do that. And this has only been possible because they could design this knowing that you can have compressed instructions and macro fusion. Okay, so thank you. Let's see, what is the time like? Do we have time for some questions? <clears throat> 
Yes. So you're basically spending on the Um, <laughs> yeah, well, um, I mean, they've always been able to do that, right? Um, but Intel has found this to be useful. They were the ones who started doing it. Um, <laughs> so, um, Yes, but I mean, in principle, they could have they could have added instructions that come, that are similar to um, uh, to these fusion operations. Um, I think the the downside with uh, adding lots of instructions because you can imagine this you create a, uh, an explosion of permutations if you know every <laughs> two or three instructions that you can put together in different ways. Uh, that's going to require um, quite a lot of different instructions to decode. So you're, you're spending a lot of your encoding space. And this is one of the things that RISC-V uh, designers have considered important is not to paint yourself into a corner by, uh, by using up all your encoding space. That's what ARM did, for instance, uh, originally with their 32-bit architecture. So they couldn't add um, compressed instructions after the fact. They, they spent their encoding space. And they want this to be a long-lived instruction set architecture. What is going to be efficient in 10 years to do? We don't know. Maybe macro fusion is replaced with something else. <laughs> we don't know. So if we kind of preemptively try to be smart about this and add lots of instructions, uh, we might have add instructions that are not going to have value in the future. So that's why they're, they're trying to do as much as possible with as few instructions to be um, Future proof. So, for an architecture that's mainly meant for industry like x86 and ARM, um, I can agree that what you're suggesting is probably would make sense, but it might not make sense for something that is meant to be more academic and longer um, term existence. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No. Yeah, so uh, you can add extra instructions, and that can just be with the whole processor. So, uh, yeah, well, if you take, for instance, um, if you take the vector instructions extension, that adds a bunch of special vector registers. And then there's, regist there's instructions for moving things between the vector instructions and uh, the general purpose registers. And possibly you can have, I mean, I know that on ARM, for instance, that the lower part of the vector registers are the same as your um, floating point registers. You could possibly do something like that. Um, so th this is actually part of the benefit that people see I think with this is that um, you can kind of merge the accelerator part with a more sort of general purpose um, uh, kind of CPU um, yeah so that that's that's they're quite flexible I mean if you look at the um, this minion and maxion <laughs> chips you have the maxions which are quite general purpose but those minion ones right they have just um, you know the base, the base instruction set implemented, and the rest are kind of these uh, vector extensions, and that's all in one chip. So it's a very, it isn't even though it has these risk processor, it's not really a general purpose CPU. Those minions, they're special purpose chips. But when um, Esperanto was designing this, they they started those minion chips were originally were just um, special purpose instructions. <laughs> 
Uh, but they found that actually creating, you have to do these kind of general purpose things even when you're doing specialized hardware. And they found that it was actually quite a lot of work to get that right. And you didn't have the tools and so on. And so they, they tested RISC-V and they saw, hey, they've done a lot of the work for us. We're just going to build on that. So I think that's probably what many uh, hardware makers are going to increasingly see. Any uh, other questions? Okay, well, thank you.